Welcome to another edition of One More Light with me, Val Klein Hands. Thank you so much for joining me. This is a mental health podcast where we do everything we can to break the stigma, namely by having conversations like this one. I am with content creator and really mental health advocate, wellness advocate, all the above, Sierra McConaughey Colath. I am so excited to have her here. Sierra, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm all about getting on and talking about anything mental health because the more we talk about it, the more people hear about it and the more it becomes normalized. Amen. When we were emailing back and forth, you were like, this is such a normal thing that we talk about in some school districts or some households. And I agree. Why do you think that is? I think that technology has allowed us to connect on a more individual level and discuss more mental health concerns, whereas past generations have not had that connection to really get down to the gritty and discuss, I'm feeling this way, or this makes me feel that way. And technology lets you feel whatever way you feel and comment it on wherever you want to comment it. So I really think the rise of technology has brought mental health up to the table. And it's a great thing, but technology can also be very harmful to mental health. So there's a fine balance between what is good and what is bad with technology and mental health. Okay. So maybe not everybody wants to be as out there with their thoughts on things because they might be afraid of some opinions or repercussions or just the trolls all up in the DMs and the comments that we're not here for, but they're here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, It is so hard because you can never get away from that. The only thing you are able to control in your life is you. You are your best advocate. You can always stand up for yourself. You can always control how you feel or think when someone says something. You only give words control when you let them. Mm. So true. What sparked your original interest in mental health at all? Uh, so I grew up in a very broken household, um, mentally and physically abusive growing up. So when I turned 16, got my license and was out of the house more, I was talking with people and really figuring out like, okay, I have a serious problem. And it wasn't until just about a year ago. Now I was actually officially diagnosed with, um, general anxiety disorder. And ever since then I've had (laughs) Ever since then, I've been very passionate about spreading awareness and just making people feel understood because that is, I felt so misunderstood for the longest time ever. And I want to do anything and everything I can to help even just that one person know that they belong here on this earth. They have a purpose and their mental illness, their mental health is not going to stop them from achieving any of their goals. Absolutely not. Can you take me back to the moment that you realized, oh, I'm finally getting help here. This is what's working for me and my mental health situation. I think the moment I realized that I was getting help and getting better was a month into being on medication. I am a Zoloft user. I'm very proud to say that I don't um, take like any word judgment, whatever, it's whatever. I have to take it. That is what I need to function properly, what my hormones need. Mm -hmm. And about a month into taking the medication, I felt like a completely different person. It was like reintroducing myself to me all over again. Like, hi, what do you actually like? You know, not what does Joe Schmo down the road want you to like? Like, who are you? And so the last year has really just been rebuilding and figuring out who I am as an individual and what I want to do with my life. Yeah, that's something I really struggled with a lot too, like especially with generalized anxiety disorder. Like it is that excessive worry that you're going to upset somebody or you're going to piss them off or you're like, and it's like excessive, like it's at the forefront of your mind to the point where you will do anything, including self-sabotage to make that person happy or avoid conflict, whatever you want to call it. That was my huge struggle too. And until I started taking Celexa, I, that didn't calm me a whole lot. Like it was a lot worse then. Now it's at least manageable and I can get through most days, but they're just out here doing the most with this anxiety. It is. Yeah. So, so real. Why do you think it was important to you to become a mental health advocate? 
I have always been tied to social media. I've always loved being on it and scrolling. Um, but I have noticed in the last year that there's a lot of content on social media that is false advertisement, just trying to get the trends, just trying to get the views. And I was sick of seeing it. And the only thing I can do as an individual to help improve what social media is pushing out is posting content that is real, that is true, that is relatable and is not stigmatized or stereotyped and make you feel like you have to feel a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely important. And we do need to see more about that because we, there's, huh, I mean, it, it's like a blessing and a curse. We see so much on TikTok, Instagram, everything. And then it's like, we hope that even just a little percentage of that is actually positive because there's so much that isn't. So we definitely need like a balance there and we need more representation there for sure. Um, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned like it took some time to initiate a mental health conversation and talk about it. And it took you time to figure out who you could be comfortable having those types of conversations with. How do you think that we can initiate a mental health conversation when the rest of society just says, yeah, let's not talk about that? Right. I definitely think mental health is something that if people are not willing to open their ears and listen, you're not going to be able to make them. So there's definitely has to be an understanding that if someone doesn't want to listen, you might not be able to tell, or if you do tell, they just might spit it out the next year. Um, but as for getting those conversations started, it definitely starts with advocacy for me, advocating for those around you, yourself, how you're feeling, what you're experiencing, because without all of these stories and different perspectives out there, there's someone that feels misunderstood. There's something that goes, slips through the cracks. So without people standing up and starting to just talk, that's simply it, just talk. Mm -hmm. We, we don't open that conversation for mental health and someone has to start it. And it could be any single person listening to this. It could be, if you see someone being bullied out in public, it's standing up for them. It can be, if you see someone online commenting something on someone's post, hyping them up and just ignoring the other person, just right. really standing up and being there for each other is so important. Yeah. So it kind of sounds like you're saying your own advocacy and your own morals and your own values really inspired you to just be vocal about your own needs when it comes to your own mental health. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've always um, had to be my own advocate. I didn't grow up in a house where my parents were necessarily an advocate for me. So from a young age, I had to learn how to use my voice. And it was hard to do that with anxiety because you have things you want to say, but you don't know if it's the right thing to say. And then you go back and forth in your mind so much, but uh, definitely advocacy and mental health are hand in hand for me at this point in time. Yeah. I've been learning that too. Like the more vocal that I've been about my own situation, my own depression, my own anxiety, the medication I use, anything like that. I mean, the feedback is 99.99999% positive. I'm sure you're finding mostly that too. And then I start to feel like, oh, okay, I did something. Even if I didn't get that personal with it, at least somebody else felt better. And it, that inadvertently makes me feel better. And it just like changes everything. And I, I'm just mm -hmm. obsessed. <laughs> um, so are there right. any- Well, if that's the system. Yeah. Are there any- system, like- <laughs> go ahead <laughs> well I was gonna go on another question but please finish your thought it's just that support system like if you see one someone talking about mental health and they might be struggling or they're posting what they're feeling it's simply hitting that like on the Instagram story voting on the poll commenting something showing up and showing that support because that is how we are going to get mental health normalized is by supporting each other facts do you think there's easy ways that we can make use of resources or uh, ways that we can maybe make environments safer so that it's easier or more comfortable to have these conversations? I definitely think that these conversations need to be held earlier. There was not very many resources in my small town high school and school district for mental health. And the resources that were there were very limited. So only students of high need were able to access those services. 
So it's really just about accessibility, but then that comes back to advocacy because without people talking about why we need these services, no one's going to implement them. So yeah. it really starts with the individual. Yeah, and making uh, the powers that be believe that this is for real. Like there's a reason why there's millions of Americans on prescriptions right now. It's, it's not something one or two people face. It's millions at this point. Absolutely. Um, at my local high school, just a few months ago, there was an active shooter um, alert. It was ended up being false. But after that, they offered counseling to the students, but those resources weren't, they were said that they were offered in like the parent email. But a lot of my peers, even my younger sibling, I asked, like, how were these available? How did they show you where to get these? You know, how did you access these? And it was a dead end. They had no clue because there's information that was being posted to the parents that's not being utilized in the schools. And I think people standing up for the wrongs that they see in that aspect is just as important for standing up for what needs to happen. Because without people saying, hey, this is wrong, nothing's going to change. Yeah. So in that situation, where was the shortcoming? The school just like didn't hand the kids the information that could help them or where was the ball dropped? I can't be exact, but from the information that I have received from peers and my family in the email that was sent out to parents, it was noted that it would, would be available the prior or the following school day. But mm. at the following school day, they send out email announcements. It was mentioned in the announcements to come to the counseling center, but there was no like set this up or set this up. So if there's 12 kids outside the counseling center, okay. you're not going to wait there in between classes. You're going to keep going. So there just was not clear cut resources for all of the students who witnessed these horrific scenes and just the drill and the anxiety of all of it to have those resources. Okay. So there wasn't, it doesn't sound like there was a lot of inner organization to it. There wasn't like a set schedule or anything where people could like sign up for a time and meet with that counselor if they felt like they needed to. Absolutely. There was nothing set in stone like that. And I'm hearing more and more of that from different communities around me in Wisconsin. And it just breaks my heart because they advertise that they care so much, but then when it comes down to the nitty gritty, they're not showing that they care with that organization and stuff. And I truly stand with that statement. I believe I believe and stand with that statement I said before that it starts with these school districts. It starts with what we're teaching our kids as they grow up. Yeah. And that goes hand in hand with, you know, parents and school districts. That's where kids spend most of their time, most of their, you know, at least early, early years, school and home. <laughs> like, why wouldn't we equip both places with, you know, we, we have what I call crisis plans for everything else. What to do when there's a fire, what to do when there's a mass shooting, what to do when there's, you know, just emergencies like that. I don't know of too many that actually say, here's what's going to happen whenever somebody is in a mental health crisis. Like when somebody is like full-blown suicidal ideation, I'm talking about, like they're serious, like they're, they're almost there. Hey, like I, I, I don't, <laughs> it, it boggles my mind that we're not accustomed to having that conversation because to me it seems pretty easy like first off have the resources we have NAMI a great organization that's national um some of us are lucky to have local ones near you I, I know I do in Minnesota I'm I'm your neighbor I don't know if I told you that but <laughs> I'm in Minnesota and <laughs> I know. And we, we do have some local resources here in Rochester, Minnesota, where I am. Um, maybe there are some near you. Now, not every community has that. So what do you do whenever you don't? Well, you make use of the national ones. And how do we get their information to the places where we don't have a lot of that communication going on? I don't know. I, I mean, it seems like it should be easier because everything's online now but we definitely need more of it. Like just getting the material in the hands of the people who really need it. Absolutely, a hundred percent. And that I feel like again, comes down to the parents and the school districts as leaders and as organizers, because it is their responsibility to have resources for these students. And there's so many resources, like you said out there, national. 
um, going to drop the 988 hotline real quick. If you have any yeah. suicidal ideation or you talk with someone, text that number, call that number. Like that is a great resource for you. But if you're, like you said, at school and something happens, where are those resources? Where is that plan? Those are conversations that will need to happen soon, sooner than later, ideally. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't know, ask an expert. Very simple. Like ask a therapist, ask a counselor, ask a psychologist, ask somebody around, hey, yeah, we're just going to craft our own plan. How do we do it? What are some of the essentials we should be paying attention to? Like, cause a lot of it I learned on my own when I went through bad suicidal ideation, like when I went through so bad that I ended up in the ER, we'll put it that way. And it was so strange to me that like, they had nothing to offer my husband as somebody who was supporting me through that. They were like, well, do you think she's a danger to you or anybody else? Okay. She can go home now. (laughs) And like, that was almost it. And then they, you know, they eventually got me into this outpatient program through Mayo Clinic, which was great, but there weren't a whole lot of resources for what do you do whenever somebody's in the middle of that crisis now? Some of the most helpful things for me were just being able to talk in that moment. Even though you're saying some like dark, scary things, like it just helped to be able to talk. It helps when you have just somebody listening, you know, it might not be comfortable to hear, but I think that person could be working through some things if you just let them talk, like venting almost. I think that's one thing we can yes, do. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So one of your more recent reels that caught my attention was the one that asked your followers to change their perspective if they're unhappy. Can you explain your thinking there and what was it that you were encouraging? Because I like that. Well, thank you for starters. Um, I, that trend has been going around for a while and every time I see it, it's like people saying, change your life. But when Mm. you see that your life is what it is. And, you know, there are some things that you can't change and accepting that is so important. So I did a spin on the trend to change your perspective because for me personally, it ties into like my life story. I have been on a health and wellness journey since I turned 18 and out of the house, trying to find foods that are good for me, um, Mm. resources and things that are good for me to be consuming mind, brain, body, all of it. Um, But I think changing your perspective starts with asking yourself, what do I want to see different in my life? Whether it be, do I want a more set morning routine? Do I want to be more mindful throughout the day? I always like to use the acronym USE um, for changing your perspective, which is understanding that you are in full control of how you feel with your actions and thoughts. No words or statements have any power over you. Setting yourself up for success every day, which I like to reference the three M's. Um, Dr. Mark Hyman has a podcast where he talks about the three M's a lot, and I really like those, but those are mindfulness, movement, mindset, setting yourself up for success that day so you can change your perspective and focus on the goals that are in front of you and not things that may be down the line or out of the picture that don't need to be in front of you on the table yet. And finally, that E is educate yourself about what you are putting into your body and your mind and your soul because so much of technology and stuff now is just scrolling endlessly through Mm. for the for you page endlessly through the reels on instagram and you're not really paying attention to what you're consuming and sometimes you can get into like a rabbit hole on tiktok where you're like i don't know i'm like why am i side of tiktok yeah like why why am i looking at chickens that are laying eggs at 3 a.m and just the the, why (laughs) Absolutely. So just that education of, um, you know, looking at research with how technology and social media is affecting different individuals, looking at the back of your food labels to see what you are putting into your body. Those small things can make a world of a difference and really set you up to change your perspective. Yeah, I have found that mindfulness definitely like just like pauses my train of thought, literally like puts it to a halt. And then I'm like, finally able to focus when I just, oh, all right, let's put a pause. Let's be mindful. Let's look at this in my surrounding. Let's just casually observe things and let it go by. That's what mindfulness essentially is in my opinion. And Mm -hmm. when I do that, it just makes it so much easier to just focus and you can shift your thought and be like, 
huh, okay, what was the challenge again? Okay, let's think about this a little more and then think about what are we gonna do to revol resolve it moving forward? Um, I love the mental, uh, you know, I love the wellness journey. I love the wellness talk as well. I'm guessing you're somebody that believes overall wellness goes hand in hand for staying mentally healthy as well. Can you talk about your wellness philosophy a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I strongly believe in like the spine is the dirt, like is life. Spine is life. So if someone like is struggling with migraines, back pain constantly, maybe you're having different symptoms. The root cause of all of these things you're dealing with could just be the connection in your spine is not working because your brain connects to everything in your body through your spine. So if that neurological connection is not in place, it can be hard to do things you want to do, such as exercise more or lose weight, the normal wellness things, as well as different you know, extracurricular activities, or even just the thinking, because again, that spine connects everything to your brain. So that is a really important part of my wellness journey, as well as understanding that the quality of food we are consuming in today's day and age is 40% decreased in nutrition from 100 years ago. And that is only 100 years, we are 40% decreased in our nutrition. So that what that means for wellness is looking at what you're eating and how what you're eating might not have all the supplementation you need. So you mm -hmm. have to go to those supplements. So for me, my minerals are amazing. I work with a doctor who his famous slogan is, if you have 90 problems, minerals could fix 99 of them because <laughs> so many mental headspace problems and headaches, fatigue, tiredness, energy is related to the fact that stores want production over quality. So they're oh, yeah. gonna produce more than they probably need over the quality of the food, which means that our soil is not allowed to recharge in that rain mm. cycle, which is where it gets the minerals that it needs. So you do get minerals from your foods, but not enough to benefit the body. So that's definitely something I would recommend looking into if anyone's interested. Um, Trace Minerals is a really good brand or Quinton, Q-U-I-N-T-O-N, both seawater minerals, great, easy things to use in your water once a day and truly life-changing for me. Yeah. Are all those things on your website? Yes, they are. My link in my bio is like a link of a million links. So check out all the links. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all the links. No, okay. My favorite link, you're going to think that I'm such a dork, but when I clicked on your contact, your contact page on your website, and I just see this big old picture of Wiley. You, I, I think Wiley is an English setter. Is, is that right? He's an English Springer Spaniel. Oh, Springer Spaniel. Okay. I just see this like big old like English Springer Spaniel head just looking at me and the contact page and I absolutely fell in love. I've always had a theory that pets do wonders for our mental health too. It, is your dog that guy for you? He's currently laying on my feet. Um, he he oh, never hello. like, yeah, he never stops touching me. He is such a sweet dog. Um, if anyone's not familiar with the Springer breed in general, they are Velcro dogs. So they are always at your hip. They are always wanting to do what you're doing. <laughs> so I absolutely love him. Um, he's like my baby and he definitely did improve my mental health and help my mental health journey. I lost my childhood dog about a year before we moved to Stevens Point. Um, mm. And we lived in Stevens Point for four or five months and we didn't have a dog and I, that was when my depression was at its worst. And one day I was scrolling on Facebook. Someone said, come get this dog or I'm taking him to the shelter. Called uh, in to work sick the next day. Went and got him and he's been our baby ever since. He's so that is, amazing. That is the best reason to play hooky I've ever heard in my life. I'm going to go get a dog today. Bye. Y'all don't know this now, but you know, it's funny. I think my boss at the time, Cass, is probably going to be listening to this. So Cass, I'm sorry. I haven't told you until now, but I totally skipped work that day to go get my dog. <laughs> go get my dog. You know, I think she'll forgive you. I'm sure when she sees the pictures and how much Wiley does for you, I, I think she'll forgive you. I think it's fine. But 
that best reason best reason i freaking love it what's next for you and what can we look forward to coming from you uh, well, I am working with a health and wellness company on Instagram. We always have new exciting things coming. We have a new hairline that's supposed to be launching soon. Um, just so many big opportunities in that business. I am also working on a book right now. I am hoping to finish that and have it launched by January 1st. So keep an eye out for that. But that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> she's not busy at all. Like she's she's got nothing going no. on. No. <laughs> Well, Sierra, thank you so much for chatting with me, sharing some of your thoughts, your philosophies. Thank you for being an advocate. I'm definitely going to send some people your way just in case they need it, because the more of this we see, I, we both agree, the better off we are. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I had a great time.